All right. It is a uh, it's a blessing to be able to have the students with us in, in worship today. We have a lot of volunteers that help uh, with Joyland. They do a great job in preparing and creating great environments for our, our children. And thank you to those of you that are, that are serving that way. Uh, something I want to mention, though, at the same time, even though we provide those environments, anytime you want your child to be in this room and worship with us, we're good with that, too. So uh, there, there's a benefit to children worshiping with adults because they get to see mom and dad, grandpa and grandma and other adults worship the Lord. And so anytime they're in here, children are not a distraction, all right? So anytime uh, kids are making noise, it's okay. It's not going to bother the pastor. I'm distracted anyway. Um, it, I don't know what I'm doing up here. Uh, so uh, children crying, boy, that's just, that's a reminder that the church is alive. So we, we want that kind of thing. So you be fruitful and multiply. All right. So anyway, uh, I told you I didn't know what I was doing. Children are a blessing. Have at it. Um, welcome to those that are still watching online. We want to welcome you. I'm sleep deprived and... Too much coffee, so pray for the pastor today. Uh, we mentioned last week that a number of us had a trip to Israel planned that is now postponed. So uh, just as an FYI, many of you have been asking, are you still heading over that way? No, uh, that trip is postponed. We'll do it another time, and we just need to continue to pray for the peace of Israel. And uh, let's go ahead. Let's, let's do that right now. Why not pray? Let's talk to God. Father, we thank you that you are alive and you are seated on the throne even when this world is in turmoil. When everything shakes, you're not shaken. You're a firm foundation. Thank you, Father, for seeing us, for loving us, for holding these nations in your hands. Lord, we pray for the peace of Israel. We ask, Lord, that the war would end, that peace would reign. We thank you for your sovereignty and your ability to oversee all of this. We don't know the future, but we do know that it's in your hands, and we're going to trust you, and we love you. We ask, Father, that you would be with us now as we open up your word. We thank you that the children are in this room and get to worship with us. We pray that uh, their hearts would be blessed, that our hearts would be blessed, that we would be encouraged by your presence, by the truth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, today as you open up your Bible, we're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, as you're turning there, uh, there's, there's something that's been on my mind over the past couple of weeks that's been brought to my attention, and it's things that, <clears throat> sorry, it's things that I know, but I have to be reminded of sometimes because it just kind of rises to the top, and that is the fact that people are self-centered. N not you, right? You're fine. Yes, we are. But for the, yeah, you, we are. I am. We're, we're man-centered, and that's the gravitational pull of our soul. We just focus on ourselves. And I fight against that kind of thing in me, and I, I see it in others as well. We are self-centered rather than God-centered. God has called us to take the attention off of ourselves, to stop putting ourselves in, in the center of the story and think that the whole world revolves around us. It does not. This whole world revolves around God. God is to be central. He is to be first in all things. Jesus put it like this. He was speaking the, the best sermon ever, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He says, but seek first, what? The kingdom of God. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. He's going to take care of everything else. But first things first, and first thing is God. But so often God is not first, we are first. But he has to be first in our thoughts, in our actions, in our deeds, in all that we do. God is to be first even in our finances. And that's a little bit of what we're talking about here. And when we talk about giving to God, it comes all down to whether or not God is trustworthy. Can I trust that God would meet my needs? And I can personally tell you, yes, every single time. God has met my needs. He is trustworthy. He is faithful. And on the other side of trusting this trustworthy God with our finances, on the other side of that is blessing and joy. And that's why we talk about these things. And that's why God so often talks about giving and, and money within his word because there is blessing and joy. It is more of a blessing to give than in keeping. 
Now, the issue becomes, in our self-centered, man-centered kind of minds, after we give, our mind sometimes can start going in the direction of thinking of what we could have bought had we not given. So there's that thing on the inside of us, then we start feeling miserable, like, well, I could have used that money for whatever. I want you to think about it this way. Imagine you've been training for the Olympics, whatever, whatever event, you're training for the Olympics, and you make it. You qualify for the Olympics. After all of that hard work, after all of the energy, waking up early mornings, the strict diet that you were on of macaroni and no macaroni and cheese on Thanksgiving and no tacos, right? The strict diet of no ice cream and all that good stuff, it finally pays off and you make it to the Olympics. Now imagine you don't just qualify for the Olympics, but you get a medal and you're standing on the podium. You either got gold, silver, bronze. Now, here's the interesting thing. In 2010, USA Today did a survey of people who were on the podium, gold, silver, bronze, and they wanted to see and test their happiness. And they discovered that the happiest person on that podium was the person who won gold. They won. They're excited. They reached the top. But something interesting, the second happiest person wasn't the silver medalist. It was the bronze medalist. You see, the silver medalist is standing on the podium and they're looking at the person who won gold and what they're thinking is, I came so close. I came so close, but I didn't get it. I didn't get there. And they're looking up at the person who got gold and they're smiling, listening to their national anthem and they just, I hate you. <laughs> the person in third, the person in third, they're thinking, I almost didn't make it here. I almost didn't get to stand up here. I almost didn't get a medal. They're just happy to be there. So one person is thinking about what they don't have. The other person is thinking about what they do have. This is called counterfactual thinking, where people begin to regret what they don't have, and they dwell on that, versus being thankful for what they do have. And I think that's the case for so many of us. We can get in this mode where we start looking at other people and what they have, and we can start thinking about, well, it could have been this way in my life, or I should have had this, or I look at somebody else and they have something more than me and I want what they have. That's called coveting, by the way, and that's a sin. And so we start dwelling on, boy, this, this didn't work out for me, this isn't fair, and we start looking at what everybody else has, and then what, what we have is this selfishness. Rather than being grateful and content, we are selfish and we are ungrateful. So the Apostle Paul is going to address this to a young man named Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And as Paul writes to Timothy, at this time, Timothy's a pastor. He's an elder in a particular church in Ephesus. Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey. And you can still go there today, and you can visit and if you go into modern-day Turkey and you go there to the site of Ephesus, they're excavating and they're pulling everything away. And those homes are absolutely amazing. They're beautiful. The people in Ephesus were rich. I mean, they had great homes. They had mosaics on their, their walls. They had indoor plumbing. They had heating and cooling. Very creative, very wealthy, very blessed group of people. And this is what Paul writes back to the pastor, Timothy. Verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And so there's this unique relationship between what we have and what we do with our finances and the kind of life that we end up experiencing. And I wonder how many of us would be able to, dis to say today that we are experiencing the life that is truly life. And so what I want to do is I want to, to compare and contrast the way that typical Americans live versus what Paul is describing for Christians to live. 
So we're going to take quickly a macro view of, of what we tend to see in the culture around us, and then we'll zero in on what Paul is instructing here through the Spirit of God. Now, when I think about the United States, I think about America, I, I think how people are living is we're typically driven by advertising, I mean, we have all of these commercials, all of these things that keep coming at us. Uh, they kind of convince us that we need to be chasing after cars and clothes and careers that we hate in order to buy things that we don't need. That's the big push. You need things. You've got to have stuff because if you have enough stuff, your life will be complete. If you have the right stuff, if you have more stuff than somebody else, well, then you're better. You'll be happier. That's what the culture keeps pushing our direction. Now, remember what Jesus said. What did he tell us to seek first? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Well, then, what we see the added things are, verse 31, therefore, don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So the Gentiles, those are the unfaithful. People who are unfaithful, they're running after, they're seeking after all of these things. And that's what we have the world telling us to do. Run after all the things. Keep seeking those things. What do advertisers tell us to do? Here's what to eat. Here's what to wear. Here's what to drink. Here's how to live. And the whole time, we're being manipulated. We're being manipulated. Our emotions our values, our personalities, they're under siege by the culture. And the culture is being shaped by media and it's being shaped by marketers. And all of that is controlled by people who have a whole bunch of money, big corporations and others who want to make more money. And you can see what happens in our culture where they try to steer a group of people in certain directions in order to get the response that they want. It happens all the time. My eyes were open to this in 2020 and after 2020. When media kept saying certain things over and over, stoking fear, stoking fear, we're being manipulated. That's what's happening in media. That's what's happening in marketing. They're telling us that the system of the world says, get a bunch of stuff, get the right stuff, and if you're not satisfied, you bought the wrong stuff, you need the better stuff, so keep at it. In the book, The Story of Stuff by Annie Leonard, she explains that after World War II, marketers and economists, they got together and they started to try to decide how can we get people to buy more stuff? Now, why would they do that? They would do it because they want more money. And marketers, media, they're smart. They're brilliant at, at getting people to think certain things and do certain things. So here's what they determined. We're gonna take a couple of strategies and begin to work these strategies and we're gonna make more money. So the first strategy that they had was something called planned obsolescence. They said, let's, let's have planned obsolescence. This is where something either wears out or breaks on purpose, where it's just going to kind of come to an end. We want some obsessive consumers. We need to sell more things. So the things that we sold, they need to break. And I think they've get, gotten better and better at this over the years. I do. I think my appliances are on a timer. And they're just like, they're going to die. I've gone through, I can't tell you how many refrigerators and washing machines and dishwashers. Meanwhile, other people have the old ones maybe out in their garage and they've outlasted me. I've had five in the amount of time those others are working. It's planned obsolescence. It's planned to break. Uh, here's a more modern kind of example. Apple. Apple got in trouble. They got sued not long ago and lost because they were slowing down their devices. They were slowing down the batteries so that you would go out and get a new device. That is planned obsolescence. That wasn't a quirk. That wasn't an error. That's a way of making more money. We're being used. Planned obsolescence. I remember visiting my grandparents' house. Maybe some of you remember this. I remember seeing furniture in their house lasted 50 or 60 years. When they bought something, they realized that furniture was going to last the rest of their life. Now we buy stuff from Ikea. We're not quite sure if it's going to make it home. <laughs> it's, it's particle board, right? It's wood chips and glue. Like that's all that it is. It's nice to carry because it's light, but it's, it's not going to last. People these days, they, they don't expect anything to last them the rest of their lives. They don't make them like they used to. 
You look at some of the stuff, some of the items that we use, what used to be metal or wood, it's now plastic. I look at some of the toys that I used to play with in the 70s and 80s, and I look at the new versions, and I'm like, that's it? That's cheap junk. There was a point at which, remember Lincoln Logs? They were made of cedar. Well, at one point, they, they stopped this. At one point, they stopped making them out of wood, and they started making them out of plastic. Lincoln would be disappointed, right? I mean, that's not the way, that's not good. And so slinkies, I remember slinkies. Slinkies were metal. Not long ago, they started making them plastic. When I was a kid, I had toys that were, were metal. The toy trucks that I had, they were tin. I had one toy that I played with. It was cast iron, right? I mean, you knew it was a good play date when your friend went home bloody because you whacked him upside the head with a dump truck. Remember the dump truck that's made of tin, that yellow thing? That's got, yeah, it's got rust and blood on it. Now, those were the days. So uh, this is their plan. The plan is planned obsolescence. You're going to throw it away. It's going to break. You're going to need another one so that they can keep making money. This is about stuff. So that's the first one, planned obsolescence. The second one is perceived obsolescence. I'm telling you, these people are smart. So with perceived obsolescence, they're going to tell you, man, you're not trendy. You're not cool enough. We're, we're going to make it in, in such a way that if you don't have this, you're on the outside looking in. You, you don't have the right thing. So we take perfectly good working products and we throw them away to get the new one. That's how goodwill is staying in business. This is what happens, especially with clothes, right? Clothes are always going through these different trends. Where does that come from? That is coming through media. It's coming through the culture. And I've lived long enough that I know that clothes, they tend to have a cycle, right? They, they go out and then they come back, which makes me think I should have kept my clothes from the 80s, but I don't think I could fit in them. <laughs> Those size 28 parachute pants will not fit on your pastor. You're like, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> One leg. That's it. This is planned and it is perceived obsolescence in order to have more purchase. It's the culture. In our culture, we get reduced down to work, watch, spend. Work really hard at your job. Come home exhausted. Sit down in front of the TV and watch what they're telling you you've got to have. And if you don't have that, well, your life isn't complete. But if you get that thing, oh, well, now. Now you'll be satisfied. Now your heart and that thing on the inside of you will be fully and finally satiated. But it never is, is it? It's like an appetite. It never goes away. There's been times that I've pushed away from the buffet and thought, I'm never eating again. Four hours later, I'm eating again. <laughs> it's the same thing with things. We keep thinking, if I just get that car, if I just get that home, if I just get those clothes, man, my life will be complete. Mom, dad, if you could just get me this present at Christmas, I'll never ask for another thing ever again. Why? <laughs> it's not true. Because there's this thing on the inside of us that is never satisfied, where we keep thinking that it's things, what to wear, what to eat. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek his kingdom first. So when we, we have all this stuff, it's just flying at us. And I know this isn't part of our, our culture, but I found something very interesting. Back in 2006, I mean, we have all of this media flying at us. In 2006, in the country of Sao Paulo, Brazil, the mayor there decided that he was going to get rid of all outdoor advertising. Now, that's a big deal. If you've ever flown over Sao Paulo or been in Sao Paulo, you know it's a big place. Over 12 million people there advertising everywhere. And so what they did was they took down every billboard or they covered everything in white. And when they did that, in this city of 12 million people with a cacophony of all of the visual and buy this and do that, people began to report that they felt differently. They were happier. They were lighter. They said they were peaceful and more content. They started finally noticing architecture again. All of the architecture and beauty had been covered up by all of the shiny and blingy. And on the inside of us, our souls crave things. And God in his love wants to free you from that so that we might seek him first above all things. All right, so that's kind of how culture works. Let's go back again. First Timothy 6, 17. Let's do this a verse at a time. Verse 17. As for the rich in, the present, in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, 
nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. All right, the word rich. If I were to ask you, who's rich? You would always say, you would think someone else is rich, right? You would think about other people, maybe in our own area. And if I were to say, all right, who's rich? You would point to a, maybe a certain community and you'd say, oh, that's where the rich people live. And I bet if we went into that community and we asked those individuals, where are the rich people? Are, where are the rich people? They would point to another group of people because it's always somebody else who has more. Those are the rich people. But I propose to you that we are rich. We are rich. We don't see it because we live around it all of the time. And I would say that despite the inflation that we're experiencing, despite the government printing more money for itself, it's going to get that money back, despite even a devaluation in the dollar, that we live among the wealthiest of all nations on the planet ever. Like if you, if you cashed in all of our chips since the founding of the United States and all of the rich resources that we have, we are among the wealthiest that there has ever been. We are rich. If you own a car, if you own one car, if you own a car, 80% of the people, eight out of 10 people in this world will look at you and go, that's amazing, you have a car. What would that be like to be able to just drive yourself? One out of three, it's pushing a little bit better, one out of four people don't have access to clean drinking water. Now, that's changing because of a lot of hard work by, by wealthier nations to help people get cleaning water, but there'd be a number of people that would watch you in your house, walk to your sink, turn a faucet, and their jaw would drop. Are you kidding me? Clean water is coming out of that in your house? You don't have any jugs to walk miles away every single day to bring back water? Well, you're rich. Friends, we are rich. And throughout history... When God would bless a nation like ours, he would bless that nation so the nation would be a blessing to others. And I don't want this message to be a guilt trip. This isn't a guilt trip. It is not your fault that God chose and God planned for you to be born in the richest country in the history of the world. That was his choice. He could have put you anywhere. He could have put me anywhere. But by his choice, he put us here with so many blessings. And we could begin to look at it as the person who's standing in second and looking at somebody else who has more and be like, oh, I don't have what they have. Or we could begin to look from third place and be like, I can't believe I'm here. And I believe that's how we should look at the gospel as well. I believe myself to be in that bronze medal position with the gospel where I say, I almost didn't make it. And quite frankly, I'm getting a medal not based on my efforts or my abilities, but on the effort and the ability of Almighty God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, and said that one. Not my hard work and my effort and boy, my training, and I'm going to accept you, God, and you are lucky to have me. No, God in his mercy moves my direction and plucks me out and says you and puts me on the podium, earning a medal that I can't earn. He did it. I almost didn't make it here. It's counterfactual thinking. Thanking God for what we have rather than what we don't have. And here's, here's the interesting thing. So God's given us this stuff, right? And again, this isn't about you feeling guilty. Because watch this, watch. At the end of verse 17, it says, God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. You don't have to feel bad about it. You don't need the pastor or somebody guilting you and manipulating you and like, oh, you're really rich and you need to start giving more money. No, no, you get to enjoy it. You get to enjoy your car. You get to enjoy your clean water, enjoy the roof that you have over your head because every single one of those things, boy, that is a gift from God. Everything, your home, your cars, your clothes, your food, your furniture, all are gifts from God. And it's okay to go ahead and go home and enjoy those things that God has provided. But... The warning is, don't put your hope in that stuff. Don't put your hope in money and stuff because money and stuff is not trustworthy. God is trustworthy. Pursue God, not things. Don't pursue stuff. Pursue God. 
but seek first, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things, they'll be added unto you. I'm telling you, once you are pursuing God and you've put him first, all those other things, they're just peanuts. They don't really compare to salvation. They don't really compare to the riches and glory that we have awaiting us. They're just things that God has put into rich people's hands like yours and mine to do something with, to pursue him, to bless his kingdom. But yet there's this pull, right? There's this pull where I just I want more stuff. But in the end, all this stuff, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I have yet to hear an elderly person on their deathbed say, you know what? The, the one regret that I have in my life is we just needed more square footage. My greatest regret was we didn't get the model of car that was nicer. On their deathbed, I've never had anybody say, you know what my problem was? I just wasn't cool enough and trendy with my clothes. Because in the end, that's not what we're talking about. Most often what I hear is something related to relationships. I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. I wish I would have loved my husband better. I wish I would have loved my wife as she deserved. I wish I would have given my all to God before being on this bed. All that stuff, it's trappings of this world. And God in his loving grace and mercy as your heavenly father wants to break that for you. And so he begins to say, seek first my kingdom. I'm gonna take care of those needs. That's mine to worry about. You seek me. So what do we do? What do we do? God's given us these things. What do we as rich people do? Well, Paul doesn't leave us. He says, verse 18, here's what rich people are to do. They're to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. That we would use our wealth in such a way that we're generous and that we're sharing with others. Sometimes I think that people think that everything that they get, they have to spend on themselves. We don't have to do that. All of that isn't just for us. See, this is the danger of, of consumerism fulfilled. Because in consumerism fulfilled, man, it just pushes us to this place where we get in deep trouble. And we end up in over our heads and, and we get a whole bunch of debt. In, in fact, right now, right now in the United States, we have more consumerism debt on credit cards than ever before. We're at $1 trillion as people. Not just the government, us. There are 43% of people every year who end up spending more than they make. And it's so difficult. I mean, it, it's, it's elevated exponentially in sharing and being generous when you're up to your eyeballs in debt. It, it, it begins to become, become so much harder to let go of those kinds of things. And so maybe just as a practical matter today, walking away like, okay, here's the tangible thing I took away. I'm gonna determine that in my life, every single paycheck, the first person to get paid is God. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those other things will be added to you. God, I'm gonna take you up on your word. You're first, I'm not first, I'm not man-centered, I'm God-centered and I'll prove it with the thing that is closest to my heart and that is my money. And then after you put God first, maybe it's time to put yourself next. Take a portion, put it in the bank and save it. And not just for yourself, but for future generations. And not just for future generations, but so you have the ability and the margin to be able to share when a need arises rather than just feeling that tug on your heart and realizing, I don't think I can do it. To have the ability, to have the margin, to see a need and meet it, that is where blessing and joy begins. That's what rich people are to do. God is inviting us into something deeper here. So Paul says, what are you going to do as a rich person? Well, I'm going to do good. I'm going to do good. I'm going to do good works, and I'm going to be generous. I'm going to be ready to share. And then watch this. This is amazing. Verse 19, thus, so at the end of this, thus, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And so this is amazing. It's not as if everything that we're sharing is just going away and we never see it again. We're going to see it again in heaven. 
There are treasures prepared for us in heaven as a result of what we are doing in this short little blip of a life where we have no longer an entanglement to this world and the things of this world, but we're moving things on ahead and we're expanding the kingdom of God for his namesake by being generous. When you're generous, when you're ready to share, when you're doing good deeds, that is when we take hold of life. That is truly life. And if you don't think this is true, if you don't think that, that sharing and being generous and, and, and not thinking of self doesn't work, I invite you to take a look at a majority of celebrities, at a majority of actors and singers. I mean, why do you think that there is so much alcohol abuse and drug use and narcissism and infidelity and betrayal and divorce and suicide? It's because getting everything you want never satisfies. It never satisfies. Consumerism fulfilled, it's toxic to our soul. And here we have daily on average 600 advertisements coming our way, luring us to be trapped into the world. They're telling us, as Jesus pointed out, what to eat, what to wear, what to drink, reminding you of what you don't have and you so desperately need. And if you just got that thing, well, then you would truly be happy. So maybe we don't need to be asking, what can I get? Maybe we should ask, what can I give? See, that's counterfactual thinking, where the person in third place is thankful for what they have rather than what they don't have. It's definitely countercultural thinking. And when we begin to think about very practically what happens when we return to God, I think about what happens around here. I think about the way that so many people before us and even individuals in this room continue to invest in the kingdom of God. And I think about our children. I think about the kids that we love on and believe in and, and we're, we're building them up and trying to shape their faith. I think about the partners and missionaries that we have uh, around the world and all that they're doing to care for the needy and the poor and invest in their lives and make a difference in those places that we don't have the ability to be in, but then we end up supporting and encouraging. I think about the people in this room, just even in a short period of time, who have stepped across the line of faith, heard the good news of Jesus Christ, that he brings salvation, he's changed them, and transform them from the inside out. We've witnessed their baptisms and I rejoice because that is life. Not stuff, not things. These things are eternal. And that is what our heavenly father's inviting us into. And I'm here to tell you, friend, he is trustworthy. Let's pray. Father, my heart can so easily become self-centered focusing only on myself, worried about what I have rather than being thankful for what you have provided. Father, for all of those things that you have placed into our hands as your children, we pray that we would be good managers and stewards of what you have provided, that we would be rich. We'd be rich in good deeds, that we would be generous that we would be willing to share. And if that's gonna happen, break that thing on the inside of us that becomes selfish. Fill us with your spirit. Remind us of the great price and the amount of giving you have provided by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, to rise from the grave, to invite us into life eternal, filling us with your spirit, sealing us for a day of redemption and get to spend eternity in bliss with you forever. Thank you, Father, for your good gifts.